So I, I guess we're ending our mini-series on Romans 8, 31 to 39. We've allowed this passage to answer accusation, accusations such as, you can't be sure that you're saved. Or last time, faith in God, faith alone, this whole justification by faith alone doctrine, that is not enough. And here is our final accusation. God will stop loving you. If you mess up, God will stop loving you. To which we ask a question, what can separate us from the love of God? In light of the past couple of years, it's apparent that many of the things we enjoy in life in various ways, can be quickly taken away from us. Work, or the legalities and ability to work, can be taken away from us. Freedom to travel can all of a sudden just be taken away from us. Set up a ring of fire. Recreational activities, no more sport. That can just be taken away from us. Seeing people outside the five kilometers can be taken away from us. Is there anything in your possession? Well, now some of you went and just, just grabbed and took those freedoms back, but is there anything in your possession that you are confident cannot be taken away from you? Confident that you cannot lose? Well, I want to propose one thing tonight. The love of God. If you have the love of God, let me ask you one question. What do you think can separate you from the love of God? We open up to Romans chapter 8 to answer that very question. It is safe to say by now you have seen that Romans chapter 8 beautifully lays before us the security of our salvation in the hands of God. Many have said, God's love is unconditional. But is it really? I think we could say yes and no. Is it really unconditional if Christ had to die in the place of sinners that we might know this saving love of God? Clearly, obviously, God has conditions. He has the right to have these conditions. And then Jesus Christ met every condition when He lived a perfectly righteous life on earth, fulfilling the law of God. Since Adam, there hasn't been a single human being that has ever kept the law of God. And that's why we needed the last Adam, our Lord Jesus Christ. And He's the head of a new race. You see, Adam ushered in a fallen human race because sin entered into this world through him. But in Christ, he ushers in a new race. We are made a new people. And the way he did this was by doing what the first Adam couldn't do. Jesus was righteous and perfect in all of his ways. Then what did he do? He laid down his life for those who could never meet God's conditions. In other words, Christ met every condition required by God of man and took the place of His people so that they would be forgiven and loved by God unconditionally. That is, because we didn't meet God's conditions. Christ did. So if you ask the question, is God's love unconditional, you might say, Yes and no. From one perspective, we see that Christ merited. He, he met all the conditions of God so that the eternal fountain of love might be poured upon us through His cross. But in terms of us, we have been received by God without ever having to meet His conditions because somebody else did it for us. We experience, therefore, that unconditional love of God which we speak of for us. Remember verse 33? Who shall bring any charge 
against God's elect. It's God. It is God who justifies. And then remember verse 34. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who is interceding for us. Lest we ever doubt who we are in Christ as the elect of God declared righteous by faith in His Son. Once again, do not forget verse 32. He who did not spare His own Son, but gave Him up for us all, how will He not also with Him graciously give us all things? So how do we respond to the accusation? God's going to stop loving you. You know, you may be loved by God today, but you better watch out. He might not love you tomorrow. God will stop loving you. And sometimes when we are in certain situations in life, when we're going through certain difficulties, we might experience, we might feel that the love of God has departed from us. Hebrews teaches us that God loves His children whom He disciplines. But a lot of times, when we are undergoing divine fatherly discipline, we look at what's happening to us, and instead of thinking, this is the loving, disciplining hand of the Father, we even begin to wonder, is this God's love? What's happening to me right now? Is this really God's love? I don't feel like He loves me. Why is He letting me go through this? But let's let Romans 8 speak to the question, God's going to stop loving you, or God's love will fade away, or God will cease to love you tomorrow. Romans 8.35 says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? It's a fair question. Is anybody able to? Do you have a candidate? Can you think of anything or anyone that has the power to separate you from the love of Christ? It's a good question. And this is not speaking of our love for Christ. This is speaking of Christ's love for you. What could ever change Christ's love for those whom He died for? Paul then gives seven things that a believer might experience. Experiences that might cause you to think, I've been separated from the love of God that might cause you to think, God no longer loves me because this is happening in my life. Things that to the world might make it look like God is abandoning you and drawing back His love from you. Verse 35 continues. Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword... Shall any of those things separate us from the love of God? Let's look at each of these things one by one. Tribulation. It speaks of trouble, opposition, and oppression. And we've quoted it quite a few times recently. Through many tribulations, you must enter the kingdom of God. Distress. The experience of deep and sorrowful anguish. Persecution. Literally, it is to be chased. It is to be pursued. Especially for your faith in God, the Christians at this time would have known exactly what that felt like. To literally be chased and pursued for Christ. They even experienced famine. I don't know the last time you experienced a famine. We don't really get them much these days in such a prosperous land. They experienced it. Many people around the world, Christians, still experience it. The scarcity of food, like legitimately physical hunger, starving to death, nakedness, the lack of proper and sufficient clothing and material goods. I mean, really, when was, honestly, when was the last time you actually experienced that? We complain. We, we, we grumble. We talk about how we don't have enough of this stuff in the cupboard. How, you know, oh, I went to Woolies today and they, all, they ran out with my, of my favorite oatmeal. It's, 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 a, it's you know, horrible. How are we going to survive? I wasn't able to get oatmeal today. We're not going to have oatmeal for the next three days until they restock at, at Woolies. Did you ever wake up and go... I literally have no clothes. I just, I had one pair of clothes. That's been messed up. 
It's been destroyed. And now I'm just naked. And I don't have any clothes. No, we usually go into the closet and, and we think like, well, I don't, what am I going to wear today? I've got all these clothes, sometimes pretty difficult. Does it match? I want it to match. That one doesn't match. I'm going to go back and I'm going to change those shirts. That's usually our experience. Have we been in danger? The word here speaks of being in peril. A death-defying, life-threatening situation, much like the disciples when they were caught in the middle of the stormy night and they thought they were going to die. And maybe you have experienced that. And the sword, in particular, this speaks of the sword of the executioner being put to death like actually by state power civil authority whatever it may be the sword of the executioner because you will not bow down to Caesar you keep on proclaiming that Christ is Lord and so off with the head these are some pretty good examples right here of things that if you experience them might make a Christian think has the love of God departed? Has He stopped caring for me? And as the Apostle Paul gives these seven examples, I want you to know that he testifies of actually experiencing all seven of these things in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Turn there with me. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, we can begin in verse 21. The paragraph, the, the, the paragraph after in, in verse 21. But well, whatever anyone else dares to boast of, I'm speaking as a fool. I also dare to boast of that. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they offspring of Abraham? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I am a better one. I'm talking like a madman. And here he goes. With far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings, and often near death, five times I received at the hands of the Jews 40 lashes less one, that's 39 lashes, one lash less what is understood to be lethal, Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers in toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. And apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. Who is weak and I am not weak? Who is made to fall and I am not indignant? If I boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. That's the Apostle Paul. As he pens these words in Romans chapter 8, telling us all about things that people think can separate them from the love of God, tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword. He's not just coming up with that out of thin air. He's speaking as someone who has experienced all of these things. And as he experienced these things, he proved himself to be weak, ever so weak. Yet he says, if I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. And he gloried in the cross. He gloried in God. He saw those things not only as things that may happen to a faithful believer, but as he personally experienced them, he even saw them as a confirmation that he belongs to God. Who am I? Who am I to be worthy of suffering for your name's sake? That's how he saw it. He saw it as a confirmation of the love of God shaping and molding and disciplining 
one of his dear saints. He follows those seven things, back to Romans chapter 8, with this in verse 36. As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Paul acknowledges that these things have happened to him, that these things happen to believers, they happen for Christ's sake. Right there he's quoting from Psalm 44, verse 22. God's people, whether in the Old Testament or New, have always faced affliction for His name. In fact, get this, those afflictions are part of the all things which God works together for our good. Back in Romans 8, 28. In the early days of Christianity, it would be safe to say especially in the first century when persecution really, really erupted, it would be safe to say that at least one Christian was martyred every single day and oftentimes in a very public fashion. You've heard of the firework, the Roman candle, which really that specific firework seems to have originated out of China. Uh, but the original Roman candle is traced back to the time of Emperor Nero in the 60s A.D., when the Emperor Nero would, like the Christians so much, he was one of their favorites, that oftentimes he would take one of the Christians or several one of those Christians, impale them on wooden staffs out in the streets and set them on fire so that they could light up the streets as he would have parties. They were his candles. Tacitus, in his Annals, which is a historical work, documents this. He writes, covered with the skins of beasts, the Christians were torn by dogs and perished, or were nailed to crosses, or were doomed to the flames and burnt to serve as a nightly illumination when daylight had expired. And almost every Christian woke up each morning knowing that it was quite possible that they would join their brothers and sisters as candles today. We don't know what that's like. And maybe we never will. Who knows? But could these things, these horrifying, painful things, separate us from the love of Christ? That's the question. Verse 37 answers, No. In all these things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. In the end, they look like a bunch of losers dying, horrific deaths being set ablaze, but they are victorious in Christ. Our brothers and sisters in the Middle East look weak. Their humility is taken as weakness. They look the ones that are beaten, struck down, and even destroyed. But I tell you, they are victorious. We may suffer for the gospel of Jesus Christ, but in the end, we are delivered. What ensures us that God will never stop loving us? Well, it's Christ Himself. It's His proven love. Why, throughout history, have Christians been able to die glorious deaths for the name of Christ, for the sake of Christ's gospel? It's because that's exactly what their Lord did. Their Lord died a humiliating, gruesome, and horrific death for the sake of the salvation of His people. And this is why, throughout history, many Christians have been seen on their death march, knowing that that is the day that they would be martyred, burned at the stake, and it looked like they were marching to their wedding day. They welcomed it. They took it with open arms, for they knew they were entering into glory. They knew the kind of wrath that was poured onto their Lord Jesus Christ. What is some earthly wrath? What is some earthly suffering? What is a horrific death compared to Christ bearing the holy wrath of the Father? Christ's proven love, attested by His death on the cross, proves to us, shows us, that none of these things can separate us from the love of Christ. 
Are you afraid of what tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, or sword could do to you? The cost of following Christ? What is greater? Earthly harm or the wrath of God? If we have any sense, we would say that the wrath of God against sinners is far more horrible than any earthly harm. And if so, then we need to fear God and not earthly harm. And we need to fear God and not the things of this world. And if we do fear God, we need to repent of our sins and trust in His Son, the one who bore the wrath of the Father in the place of sinners. And if we do trust Him, we should be sure, as Paul ends here in verse 38 and 39, for I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. If you haven't chosen a life verse yet, well, just take that one. In this postmodern world where everyone claims to want love, and that's a noble desire, Due to our sinful nature, we constantly look for things which only God can provide us, while at the same time running away from God as far away as we can. Have you ever come to doubt the love of God for His people? Now, the love of God for you. Have you ever thought to yourself, you better be careful, or else God will stop loving you? Rest in those last two verses of Romans chapter 8. And remember that if you have faith in the eternal Son of God, nothing in all of creation can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. This unbelieving world will certainly try to hit you with accusation after accusation, trying to sow seeds of doubt into your mind, but your security does not lie in them. It does not lie in yourself or in the perception of people or even in your ongoing faithfulness, but in Christ alone. Rest in that. O oh God, whose love is unlike human love, whose love is an infinite and eternal perfection, we thank you for proving this love for us in and through Christ. We thank you, Lord, that not only will you never stop loving us, but you never even started you have always loved us. You have loved us from eternity. There wasn't a point in time in history, Lord, where you began to love us. You just always have. Thank you that in time we could be brought into the full experience of that love through your Son and by the Spirit. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.